right, it is time. Let's get started. Uh, rest of you, please have a seat. Uh, here we go. So, hi, uh, my name is Tomo, and uh, I come from Israel. You don't care about that. Uh, I do want to apologize, though, for two things. First of all, the scheduling change. Uh, I've been sick most of this week, as you can probably tell from my voice, so I'm not at my best. Sorry for inflicting this on you, uh, but thank you for coming uh, anyway. Second of all, um, you probably know about Slido already, given that this is the third day of the conference. Uh, if you have any questions, use Slido. Uh, we will try our best to accommodate any questions on the fly or at the end of the talk. So um, this is how shit works. This is going to be uh, the fourth how shit works talk. Uh, and this time, we're going to be focusing on TCP IP. And as always, uh, we're not going to actually start with TCP IP. Instead, uh, what we are going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about how conversations with my mom go. Um, full disclosure, or disclaimer, if you will, before we start, uh, I love my mom. I absolutely do, really. Um, so everything here is going to be a slight exaggeration, but it is semi-realistic, OK? A lot of my conversations with my mom go the way that uh, you're going uh, to be exposed to in a minute. Um, in theory, a conversation with my mom over text would look something like this, right? We have, hello, son, hi, mom. We have like a preamble or a handshake, if you will, uh, a question, an answer, like a very nice linear sequence of messages back and forth. Uh, ideally, this is what I would kind of expect the conversation to look like. Now, you will notice that this is point-to-point -point communication, right? There's two parties. There's me. There's my mom. We're talking over text. Uh, there's one continuous session or one continuous stream of consciousness. Uh, there's an explicit preamble or handshake, right? Hi, son. Hi, mom. Uh, the communication is stateful, like at any given point, each of the parties uh, that are communicating are kind of aware of what's going on. We don't have to repeat ourselves. We have the state of the conversation in our mind, and there's also explicit termination. So see you soon, love you mom, right? We know that the conversation is over. We have in order delivery, right? Everything is nice and linearly laid out. We have reliable delivery. No messages are lost. No messages are duplicated or weird things happen. Right? This is what a conversation between two people should, in an idealized reality, look like. Unfortunately, that's not really the case. A conversation with my mom usually looks more like this. Why aren't you answering? I'm in a meeting. Like, what? Uh, and then, like, a bunch of stuff. Did you get the gift for grandma? We might meet at 7, but I'm not sure, because dad has a dentist earlier. Wait a minute. This should not have been repeating. Never mind. Um, plus, I don't know if the cake will be ready on time. And then I go, what are you talking about? Like, I have no idea what just happened. It's like someone dropped me in in the middle of three separate concurrent conversations, and I'm totally out of context. Right? So. What we have in practice is we don't really get that many delivery guarantees. Right? We get out of order messages, like, did you get the gift for grandma? We might meet at 7. It's like, I would have expected at least some reasonable ordering of events in this conversation. We have unreliable messaging, like, why aren't you answering? Like, answering what? I didn't you know, receive anything. You didn't call me. I didn't get a message. Like, nothing uh, has let me realize that a conversation is going on here. Uh, we have fuzzy session boundaries, right? There's no explicit handshake. There's no hi, mom, hi, son. Uh, there's no explicit termination. So for instance, assuming we even had that prior conversation uh, last week with my mom, we were talking about a, a birthday uh, party for my grandmother, except we never finished the conversation. Like there was no acknowledgment. There was no commit of the transaction, if you will. Like we haven't decided on anything. It's all up in the air. And uh, if you've noticed, the receiver, which is me in this case, is just totally overwhelmed, right? There's, I don't know if you can actually see, there's one, two, three, four, four to five pieces of information that I just received in one single sentence, and I can't keep up. Like, I have no idea how to track this. There's too much information. I'm lost, right? So I'm overwhelmed by the sender, which is my mom. So. 
This is actually pretty amazing. Like, if you think about it, as much as this conversation made no sense at all, the fact that it's been taking place is actually kind of amazing. To start with, we could address each other, right? I uh, text my mom with her cell phone number. Uh, the operator or the, the uh, service provider takes that number, translates it to an IMSI. Uh, the packets get routed to the correct destination, right? We can actually take that number and use it to address each other, which is pretty amazing but we don't really think about that. We could communicate, right? There is a packet switching network between me and my mom that makes sure that packets sent from me actually get there through a variety of hops, right? I might be in Poland on, you know, whatever internet, uh, whatever cellular provider uh, I happen to be roaming on here. My mom is in Israel sending me messages. There's a whole bunch of networks in between. Right? There's multiple hops. These are heterogeneous networks. They don't even look the same. One is a cellular network. The other is presumably some sort of IP-based landline network. Right? There might be several networks, multiple hops. Right? This is very, very, very complex. Like routing, generally, just the, the process of a packet getting from the sender to the receiver is in and of itself incredibly complex. But we don't really have to think about that. We can transmit. Right? It's all fine and dandy for the packets to make their way across landlines, but the bottom line is, this is my phone right here. It's not connected to anything. Right? So packets end up at a base station somewhere. A transceiver takes them, you know, does whatever it does with them, converts them to some sort of analog signal that is then sent through radio waves from an antenna to the receiving antenna on my cell phone. This is incredibly complex, but we don't have to think about that either. Right? So there are layers and layers and layers and layers of things happening between me sending a text message to my mom or vice versa and that message actually uh, ending up in its destination. Which, if you've seen one of these previous talks, is what I like to call the onion of abstractions. And it strikes again. Right? There are layers of abstractions that we're building onto, irrespective of which part of that process you're involved with as an engineer. Right? You might be working on the routing layer. You might be working on the transmission layer, or on the base station, or on any one of these things. You don't have to worry about the other layers. Right? This is the power of abstraction. So that being said, right, a whole bunch of very, very complex things worked perfectly fine for this conversation. And yet the conversation didn't you know, pan out, right? The conversation was confusing. My mom didn't get the message across. Neither of us is particularly happy about that conversation. So what went wrong? Well, it turns out that my mom and I failed to collaborate, right? My mom hadn't noticed that she was sending me data, right? Sending me packets, sending me sentences or bits of information faster than I was able to receive and consume them, right? I might be in a meeting. If she had sent a message saying, are you coming Friday, I would have said yes, right? I have enough capacity during a meeting to have that small conversation. But the fact that she sent me a whole bunch of different pieces of information meant that I was just overwhelmed. I couldn't handle it. I was not ready to receive data that fast. Second, my mom failed to realize that if I had missed something she said in a previous conversation or even in a, in a previous part of the same conversation, and I missed it, right? I don't know what she's talking about. Then she has to retransmit that data. She has to, again, tell me, you know, she might be angry about it, like we talked about it last week, but she still needs to give me that piece of information again. Otherwise, I do not have the requisite context to actually make sense of the conversation. And there was absolutely no way within that conversation to infer the order of events, right? Everything seems to be coming in all at once. There is no strict ordering. There is no numbering of the sentences or anything I can use to say, oh, OK, this sentence was supposed to come after that one. And now everything lines up correctly and makes sense. Now, and this is a, a very important piece of the puzzle for understanding TCP. You might have noticed that this example was relying on text communication, right? SMS, WhatsApp, it doesn't really matter. These systems are generally very reliable, and they generally do give you ordering guarantees, right? The messages that my mom sent were delivered in the correct order and generally did not fail to deliver. 
That didn't help though. Reliability and communication is the responsibility of the application or the, the endpoints that are communicating, right? It is not the responsibility of the cellular network and the, and the text delivery system of the cellular network uh, to ensure that my mom and I communicate in a way that makes sense. They couldn't even if they tried, right? Because there's me, there's my mom, we're both humans, we're both confused and confusing, right? The network cannot handle uh, reliable transmission at an application level, right? The semantics of communication cannot be handled by the infrastructure. So the reliability is an attribute or is a requirement, if you will, of your app. And that is what is known as the end-to-end -end principle, and that is probably the most important of the underlying principles of TCP IP. Okay, what we need is a protocol, right? We have the delivery network, we can send text messages back and forth, all of that is very, very nice and pleasant. But my mom and I need a communication protocol so that we can make sense of what we say to one another. And with that, let's talk about TCP IP. Or actually, if you've been paying attention, since we are at a relatively high level of the abstraction stack, I'm actually not going to be talking about TCP IP as a whole because that is a very, very big subject. Instead, let's focus a little bit on TCP itself, the transmission control protocol that is driving the internet and pretty much humanity as we know it. With that, second full disclosure. I am not an expert on networking. I'm not an expert on TCP IP, which means that everything I'm, going to be tell, everything I'm going to be saying over the next 40 minutes or so will be extremely simplified, right? I'm going to be glossing over a lot of detail, and some of that detail matters, some of that detail does not. A lot of what I say might be inaccurate to one extent or another, and I am very liable to be flat out wrong on certain things, right? But my intention here is to provide a certain amount of intuition as to how these things work. Because there's no such thing as knowing too much and understanding a little bit about what the abstractions that you build on top of, how they work, what they do, what they guarantee, and what they do not, can be actually super useful uh, in your day-to-day -day work. And even if it isn't, it's just fun. So uh, one final point, this is a huge subject. And I don't think I understood just how big a subject TCP, I'm not even talking about TCP IP, just TCP is such a broad subject that if you actually want to know what TCP looks like in the modern age, like 30, 40 years after it's been envisioned, um, you're gonna have to specialize in it, right? That is a research that you have to do on your own and it's gonna take months and years, right? So I uh, do not specialize in this, I do not expect any of you to specialize in this and therefore, we will barely be scratching the surface of what there is to know about TCP. So, let's get started. If we were to design a communication protocol for my mom and I to communicate, we need to make some assumptions and we need to have some requirements. One thing we can assume is existing infrastructure, right? There is the onion of abstraction, we need to pick a layer that we're in. Uh, because my mom and I are sort of at the top of the, of the protocol stack, we just need to determine a protocol uh, between ourselves, we can assume some existing infrastructure, right? So addressing, physical transmission, routing, all of these things are sort of a given in the world that we live in. In other words, we want to build on top of IP, or the internet protocol, right? Um, the distinction I'm assuming is fairly well known at this point, but I'm hoping it'll become clear as we go. And we need to have some requirements, right? What it is we're trying to accomplish here. So, first of all, we wanna have some delivery guarantees. We want our communication protocol, our application level communication protocol to guarantee that we have no packet drops and no uh, packet duplications, right? We want it to be reliable and we want the delivery to be in order, right? In terms of delivery semantics, this is what is often called at most once delivery. Furthermore, we wanna make sure that the sender cannot overwhelm the receiver, right? As before, we wanna make sure that the protocol that my mom and I use to communicate includes something, some mechanism that allows me to tell my mom, 
you know, I'm not ready to receive this much information. I'm overwhelmed, I cannot handle this. And then my mom will have that information and can scale back the rate at which she uh, provides further information, further context in the conversation. Here is one solution we could pick, right? It is super simple. You take, you know, each side at any given point can send one packet until it receives an acknowledgement. That's it, right? That neatly solves all of our problems. If I can only ever send my mom one packet or one piece of information, one piece of a sentence before she acknowledges it, before she says, okay, got it, then I cannot overwhelm her. And there cannot be out of order delivery because there's only ever one message on the wire at any given time, right? So this is a very neat solution-ish, right? This will not work. I hope it's pretty obvious, but in case it isn't, there we have the next slide. This works, but it's very inefficient. We want to have this form of communication, right? I'm sending my mom a bunch of messages, these queue up, she receives them in order, she sends her stack of messages, and everything works out nicely, right? This is what we want. Instead, with that solution, what we get is a back and forth, right? A request response protocol. And you might not notice the timestamps on these messages because they're running around pretty quickly, right? But it means that if we want to have a very simple conversation whereby we decide on certain aspects of my grandmother's birthday party on Friday, this can take, well, in this example, I think it's like nine hours, right? Just because we're not always, you know, when you're walking around, you're doing stuff, you're not always looking at your phone, you're not always receiving and responding to messages. You might just be busy. Right? So if every back and forth takes as long as it needs to, which can be hours, then a whole conversation can take an inordinate amount of time. It just will not work. It's totally inefficient. So we have an extra requirement, which is we want to maximize throughput. Right? We want to uh, make as much use of the underlying network as possible. If the network can carry 10 packets or 100 packets or a gazillion packets, and we have that much information to send, we want to be able to send all of that in a burst. We don't want to have to wait uh, on every single message for an acknowledgement. So if we take these last two items, sender cannot overwhelm the receiver and we want to maximize throughput, then the canonical way of, of saying that, right, the, the, the expression that we would use in the TCP world is flow control. Right? We want flow control as kind of a first class requirement from our communication protocol. So how does this line up with what TCP provides? To start with, sort of everyone knows that TCP is a transport layer protocol, but crucially it is a point-to-point -point protocol, by which I mean generally speaking with TCP, um, not even generally speaking, I'm not even sure there's any way of doing that, but you do not broadcast a TCP packet to multiple recipients. I suppose there might be some, you know, some protocols built on top of TCP to allow you to do that, but generally speaking, when you speak TCP, you have two hosts or two peers that communicate between them. So this is a point-to-point -point protocol. It is connection-oriented, which is something we're gonna circle back to. It is reliable and it builds on top of IP. Now, what does being a point-to-point -point protocol mean? It means that you have a client and a server, which is, it really doesn't matter actually. You have two computers or two applications within two hosts, within two host computers that want to talk to each other. And we have this pyramid of stuff, right? We have our app that's built on top of TCP, that's built on top of IP, that's built on top of some form of uh, network communication, uh, underlying network communication, physical layer, which typically would be Ethernet. Um, I'm pretty sure the vast majority of modern networks are Ethernet, but it, TCP and IP do not make that assumption, right? But there is some underlying transmission layer that actually can take your bunch of bytes, your digital packet, and send it over a wire to, uh, to the receiving end. Um, in terms of nomenclature, Ethernet speaks in terms of frames, 
right? When you put something on the wire, you put an Ethernet frame on the wire, and that's what gets received uh, by the other end. Uh, in that, encapsulated in that frame, is an IP datagram, uh, which is, it, you know, uh, in simple terms, it is source IP address, target IP address, or MAC address uh, as it gets resolved to Ethernet, uh, and a bunch of bits. Within that, TCP encapsulates its own segments, right? That is the term for a chunk of data that TCP sends from one end to the other. And generally, built on top of that, what you get is the semblance of a bidirectional bit stream. Right? When you speak TCP, when you build on top of TCP, when you build your client and your server apps, you don't think in terms of segments and datagrams and frames. You get a stream. Right? In Java, you get an actual input stream and output stream. You speak in terms of bytes. Right? So TCP gives you that abstraction on top of an asynchronous packet switching network. And that is the power of TCP. That is what it's there for. Now, being connection-oriented is another aspect of TCP. You will remember that the network that you're built on top of is asynchronous. Right? You have a packet. That packet gets put on the wire, and it goes through routers, it goes through other routers, right? a bunch of network hops, and it ends up in the target computer. Uh, so what you have is just packets running around. Right? This is fully stateless. The packet is on the wire. It gets delivered. Done. No one knows that that packet relates to any other packet in any conceivable way. That is the job of TCP. TCP provides a connection abstraction. Right? When you open a TCP socket and you connect to another device, what you're actually saying is, I want to initiate a phone call. Right? I want to pick up the phone and call google.com at port 80 so that I can you know, go do my search. There is a connection there. And a connection can be thought of as a session. There are m multiple words that you can use. But importantly, connection is stateful. Right? A connection starts at some point, and then you have communication going on over that, that established channel, and then the channel gets torn down. There is an explicit handshake or preamble. There is an explicit termination phase. And everything in between is stateful. Right? It, all arrives in, uh, it all arrives at the receiving end and the receiving end can make sense of it. Like it knows that a TCP packet belongs to a particular TCP connection. Uh, in practical technical terms, what you have is here we have uh, two hosts, A and B, and time flows downward, because that's convenient. Um, and as probably most of you know, TCP uses a three-way handshake where one side initiates the connection by sending a SYN or synchronized segment to the receiver. The receiver takes that synchronized segment, sends back its own synchronized segment along with an acknowledgment, and then the initiating side sends back a final acknowledgment. There are reasons for this. They are interesting, but they are a little bit outside the scope of what it is we're going to be talking about. Uh, crucially, though, when you have a packet going one way and an acknowledgment of that packet going the other way, you can actually start measuring certain things. And the most important thing that you might want to measure, assuming you even get the acknowledgment packet, is the round trip time, or RTT. Right? This is useful in a variety of ways, but most importantly, when you send whatever, when you ping a server, that's ICMP, not TCP, but the principle is the same. When you ping google.com, you send a packet to the Google server. It sends back an acknowledgment or an echo, ICMP echo uh, packet. And then you can actually calculate what is the length of time it takes for that packet to reach that server on the other end and come back to me. Now, you cannot actually measure half of that. Like, you cannot measure one direction reliably because the network is asynchronous. You don't actually know when uh, a packet gets delivered to the other end. You can only know when you get back an acknowledgment. And that gives you the round trip time. Once you uh, have finished this three-way handshake, you have a connection. Right? The host on one end, host A, initiated a connection. Host B responded to that request to initiate a connection. And now you have a stateful connection or an open socket in either end. Right? You have an open socket in A. You have an open socket in B. These sockets have 
uh, have an address, they have a port number. Port number is just a way of saying, you know, I have an address of a host, but I need some way of indicating which of the, the connections I'm interested in. It doesn't really matter for the purposes of our discussion, but you have a stateful open connection that you can then employ. Now, TCP is also reliable. So as you all know, in any packet switched or IP network, uh, packets can, uh, you know, can arrive out of order. Packets can be duplicated, packets can be delayed, uh, packets can be dropped, right? Uh, as far as a particular host is concerned, there is no way to distinguish between a long enough delay and a drop because the network is asynchronous. But crucially, all of these things happen in any IP-based network. And TCP needs to handle that, right? It needs to take a stream of out of order, duplicated, delayed, whatever packets, and needs to make sense of them in order to reconstruct a bidirectional byte stream abstraction. And that might seem simple, but it's not. And this is where we start going into how TCP actually operates uh, and the various challenges that it faces and how it purports to solve them. Now, finally, we, uh, to tie all of these things together, we need to talk about TCP flow control. So as, uh, as described earlier, flow control is a term used to describe two seemingly conflicting goals, right? We wanna maximize throughput. So as a sender, I wanna be able to put as much of the stuff that I wanna send on the network as fast and as early as possible. But on the other hand, I also need to know how much the receiver can accept so that I don't overwhelm it, right? And these seem to be uh, two conflicting goals, and in order to solve these uh, two conflicting goals in a meaningful way, we need to have a collaborative protocol, and TCP is a collaborative protocol. You will notice that throughout this discussion, there is no central orchestrator, right? There is nothing that tells either host what it is that they need to do in order to whatever. Like nothing tells a host, drop that packet. Everything happens uh, in a completely decentralized manner. So this is a collaborative protocol. In order to understand how TCP accomplishes this, we need to talk about sliding windows. Um, we have a sender and we have a receiver and we have a bunch of bytes, 14 bytes that represent the string hello world uh, as we all know and love, right? We wanna make sure that this message makes its way from the sender to the receiver in a way that's ordered, in a way that's reliable, no drops, no confusion, right? It needs to be very, very uh, reliable and very true to the original message. So the way TCP works is that, on, first of all, um, before I move on, it's important to note that with any TCP connection, you effectively get two separate concurrent connections, right? You have a host A and you have host B. Host A can send stuff to B. That is one unidirectional connection, one unidirectional stream, uh, stream of packets. And then you have the stuff that B sends to A, which goes in the other direction. And these two happen concurrently, but these are two separate connections. So, in order to maximize throughput, uh, what TCP does is it uses what's called the sliding window. The receiver advertises, and that is one of the things that, that the initial TCP handshake, one of the, the bits of data that the initial handshake carries, the receiver advertises a window size in bytes, right? So in this example, the receiver advertises after the handshake, I am able to receive four bytes at a time. Right? This is the buffer that I have for receiving stuff. This is as fast as I can handle incoming data. And the sender wants to make maximum use of the throughput, maximal use of the network. So it takes the receive window, which is for this example of size four, and I will circle back to what, uh, what MSS means in, in a couple minutes. Uh, and it sends those four bytes, right? We have four packets. Each packet has a sequence number. So the first packet would be H, the second would be E, then L, then another L, right? Four bytes are put on the wire. And at this point, the sender knows that it has used up as much 
uh, as much of the network throughput as it's allowed by the receiver. At some point, the receiver starts sending acknowledgments, right? Um, it is important to note that these acknowledgments are what's called cumul cumulative acknowledgments, right? So the, the receiver says, the last packet that I should have received and that I have processed is, has this sequence number. So in this case, we have the first acknowledgment for sequence number zero, which is the letter H. And when the acknowledgment gets through, the sender knows, okay, one out of the four bytes that I've sent, and importantly, the first one has been delivered. I can slide the window to the next byte, the next, next octet, the next whatever. I can process another byte. I can put it on the wire and send it to the receiver. And then acknowledgments start accumulating, and the window just keeps on moving you know, on and on to the right. And this is obviously a very simplified example, but this should give you some intuition as to how, this things, how these things work. Now, what happens if you get packet loss? Right? In this example, we have the same sliding window. We sent the same four bytes. Uh, and we even got an acknowledgment on that first byte. But for whatever reason, the second packet, including the letter E, never arrived at, uh, at the receiving end. And this can happen for any number of reasons, including uh, a switch being overwhelmed as it's routing the packets, um, cosmic radiation, you know, uh, my neighbor's dog chewed on the, network on the network cable. Whatever reason, packets do get dropped on the way. Right? So the packet didn't make its way through. Now, here's what happens. There is a, a, a very important capability of TCP that is called retransmission. This is the way that TCP handles drop packets. Now, TCP uh, uh, looks at the received acknowledgments. And crucially, the received acknowledgments are always for the latest uh, I'm sorry, um, I'm a little bit off because I'm sick. Crucially, the, the acknowledgments that are sent by the receiver to the sender always have the uh, last known byte or the last known sequence number that the receiver has taken in and acknowledged. You will notice that in this case, the receiver got H, it got L, and it got L. So it got three different packets with sequence numbers 0, 2, and 3, but it cannot confirm that it got packet 2 because that would indicate to the sender that packet 1 was also received. Right? The receiver always has to, um, to provide the sequence number that is the last fully received, fully acknowledged, fully processed packet. It cannot send 2 because that would miss one. So for every packet that it receives, it just sends an acknowledgment for the last well-known sequence number, which in this case is zero, right? It never got one, so it can't send one, and it can't send any sequence number that's greater than one. Now, after, after a packet gets put on the wire by the sender, the sender fires off a timer, right, called the retransmission timer. Now, this is the length of time that the sender allows the receiver to acknowledge a packet. Right, there is a pretty complicated way by which this, uh, this value, this timeout value is calculated, and we're not going to go into that. But once, uh, once the packet gets put on the wire, that timer fires, and at some point that timer, uh, that timer event actually occurs, right? The timeout had occurred. And once the timeout had occurred, then at that point, the sender knows, OK, the last packet that was acknowledged is sequence number 0. Right? I need to start retransmitting packets that came after 0 because I know that sequence number 1 never, was never acknowledged. So it was never processed by the receiver. Once that timer hits, it retransmits packet with sequence number 1. And then at that point, the receiver, which got all of the packets except one, say, OK, in my buffer, I have, I, now that I've received it, I have one, I have two, I have three, I have four. So I can acknowledge all of them in one go. And it sends back an acknowledgment for sequence number four. 
And then, boom, communication just continues on, right? Everything sort of comes back to normal. The uh, sender can continue sending packets. The receiver can continue acknowledging them. And everything lines up nicely. Any questions so far? Let's have a quick look at the Slido window. Nope. Awesome. If there are any questions, I'm, I'm going to try and, and take a look at Slido every now and again, and obviously at the end of the, uh, of the talk. Right, so this is a basic TCP ret retransmission. This is how TCP handles packets that get dropped. Now, this is also how TCP handles packets coming in out of order because it doesn't really matter in what order these acknowledgments come in. An acknowledgment cannot be sent by the receiver until it has sequentially, until it has already observed the previous packets. Right? There is no way that the receiver will issue an acknowledgment for sequence number three until it has seen one and two. Right? And that is what guarantees the ordering of, uh, of events in this packet stream. Now, you will notice that there is an opportunity for optimization here, right? This, just to circle back to this example, there is a wide span of time here in which nothing happens. The sender is waiting for acknowledgments, the receiver has already sent whatever acknowledgments it can, and we're just waiting for a timeout to occur. So obviously minimizing the retransmission timeout to something that is as appropriate for the network conditions as possible is super critical. But even so, there are optimization opportunities here. This is where we get into what's called TCP fast retransmission, or the Jacobson algorithm. Um, if, if for every received packet, the receiver sends back an acknowledgment for the latest observed sequence number, that means that we have four inbound, or four, even five inbound packets, right? We have sequence number zero, one, two, three, and four. And we lost one. One never showed up. But we did get four packets. So we're going issu to be issuing back an acknowledgment for H. Uh, we're going to be issuing an acknowledgment for having received a packet. But we can't acknowledge sequence number two because we haven't received one yet. Instead, the receiver just sends the latest acknowledgment. The reason it does that is because acknowledgments can be lost. Acknowledgments are just packets, and packets get dropped. So the receiver has no way of knowing if its acknowledgments had actually reached the sender, which is why it just sends them over and over again in response to packets. Now, once we have a certain number of duplicate acknowledgments for the same sequence number, we can infer that a packet had been dropped. And not only can we infer that, we can also infer which packet had been, had been dropped. The Jacobson algorithm, in this case, determines that once you get three duplicate acknowledgments for the same sequence number, you can assume that a packet had been dropped. And the packet is, sorry about this, the packet is the last known received sequence, uh, acknowledged sequence number plus one. Right? It's that simple, because if we've seen a higher sequence number, then that that the packets within that range will have been observed by the receiver. So we can opportunistically send the last uh, acknowledged packet plus one, which in this case would be retransmitting E with the sequence number of one. And you'll notice that despite the fact that this is a very made up example with like, you know, nice graphics and stuff, there is a certain span of time which we would have had to wait for the retransmission timer but we have eliminated the need to do that. We have opportunistically sent retransmitted the packet. And that is actually one of the things that make the internet function, right? Because packets get dropped all the time. If we constantly had to wait for retransmissions, that would chug to a halt. Now, up until this point, we have observed a number of variables that matter for TCP. And this is, again, a super simplified version of how TCP works with lots of inaccuracies and lots of hand waving. But I believe it's sufficient for initial intuition about what TCP does. Now, we have a number of numbers that we need to take into account. We have the round trip time. Right? The round trip time is first measured on the handshake. We send a send packet, we get back a send plus ACK packet, 
we have an initial assessment of what the round trip time is. And we keep track of this. Right? The TCP stack keeps track of every sent packet and every acknowledgement. It matches the two together. And then it has a sample for the round trip time. Now, crucially, the round trip time is not fixed. Right? If you've ever used Wi-Fi, you already know this. Right? If you ran a ping to Google just to test your Wi-Fi connection, you will have noticed round trips time, even, even for this network, ranging from 7 milliseconds to 8 to 9 to 10 to 50 to whatever. In fact, this graph right here is 150 packets sent to google.com from my laptop in a different room in this conference. And you can already see that there's quite a bit of variability. And I can tell you that the, the wireless network in this conference is one of the best I've ever experienced. The variability is low, and the network is relatively reliable. So this is a good result. And I still got some timeouts and like large uh, round trip times, et cetera. So the TCP stack keeps track of this. and it, it actually uses that for a number, of, uh, a number of algorithms and a number of adjustments, which we'll circle back to in a second. The next number that we have is that MSS that was on the screen earlier. This is the maximum segment size. This actually is a fixed number, and it is essentially the biggest chunks of bytes you can send, you're allowed to send over TCP for any particular network connection. Right? Your laptop is you're logged onto your laptop, it is connected to some Wi-Fi network. That is, now you have that number. You have a fixed number of bytes that is the upper bound of how big a packet you're allowed to send. Now, if you've, uh, if you've run across this concept, MTU, or maximum transmission unit, that is pretty much the same concept, uh, the same concept except for an Ethernet network. Right? So, um, so these two numbers are related. In fact, the maximum segment size for TCP is typically the maximum transmission unit, the MTU for any network connection, minus the header size for TCP, minus the header size for IP. But it doesn't have to be that way. Right? TCP abstracts the physical network. TCP does not acknowledge the concept of MTU. It doesn't care. What it does care about is maximum segment size. The fact that these two are related is important, but not to TCP. Um, this is negotiated at connection time. Some of the, some of the, the bytes that are sent w as you make the initial handshake, as you create a TCP connection, also include the maximum uh, segment size. And next, we have the TCP window size. Uh, now, it is important to note that in the previous example, I set an example of a window size of four. That is totally arbitrary. The window size, first of all, is dynamic. It is determined by the receiver through a variety of things, right? It is dynamically adjusted. Uh, it can be traditionally with original, the original TCP spec, it can be up to 64 kilobytes. Uh, nowadays, networks are fast compared to when TCP was uh, initially envisioned in the 70s. So uh, nowadays, the, there is a window scaling option that gets you to a window size of upwards of one gig. Now, how to determine a good window size for the receiver is a topic for a whole discussion in and of itself. Like, uh, n I couldn't because I don't understand that well enough, but a network expert could give you an hour-long talk on just how to determine what a good window size is for the receiver. But crucially, this is something that is set by the receiver. And for every TCP connection, you have two directions. So potentially, you have two receivers. right? Every, size, uh, every side of a TCP conversation maintains some, uh, some knowledge of what the receiver that is the other side can accept. Host A has the receive window size of host B. And that receive window size is advertised with each packet, and it is adjusted dynamically by the receiver. Host B maintains the, the receive window size for host A. Right? They both do this concurrently and unrelatedly in each direction. And we have the retransmission timeout, uh, which initially is set to one second. Originally, in, in older implementations, would have been three. The retransmission timeout is also dynamically adjusted. And it's dynamically adjusted based on the round trip time. Right? If you know that your round trip time is 100 milliseconds, then a good retransmission timeout would be whatever, that plus a certain 
fudge factor. In practice, estimating RTT is quite complicated, so it's not really uh, it's not really the the measured round trip time. There is a whole slew of mathematical formula that are uh, intended to estimate what a good RTT what sorry, what the current RDD is for a connection, and based of that, the retransmission timeout is set. The reason we went through all of these is, first of all, just to give you an idea of how much complexity there is to even the simplest of TCP connections. There are a lot more of these, and all of these can be dynamically adjusted or advertised by one side or the other, or estimated by certain algorithms. Don't worry about it because it's all out of scope and as software engineers typically you do not have to worry about these things. This is intended to give you some idea of just how complex it is to actually just maintain a TCP connection and send bytes from one side to the other. Whew. All right. Now we can take a deep breath and hopefully now we have some way of reordering packets, dealing with retransmissions, etc. so I can have a decent conversation with my mom. Almost. We still need to talk about how to close the connection. So TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, right? You create a connection, you have a conversation, then you end that conversation. The way this works is that one side initiates the end of the conversation by sending a fin packet to the other end. Now, a fin is a promise, right? When I send, some, when I send my mom a fin pocket, I'm essentially saying, all right, mom, I'm done, you know, I'm done. Like, I have nothing more to say to you. You can, at your own leisure, process everything that I've been said, uh, that I've said so far. I'm waiting for you to indicate that you're done sending me data as well. The other side acknowledges that fin packet, uh, which is to say, all right, I have received everything that, you, that was queued on the network up until now. I've processed it, processed it. I'm done with your part of the conversation. And at this point, the other side may keep on sending data. Right? The conversation is not over, just one side finished. At some point, the other side, B, uh, decides that, okay, it's done sending data uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to side A, and it sends its own thin packet, which A acknowledges. Both sides must single the fin. Now, here's where it gets interesting, and here's where uh, certain aspects of this design actually do have ramifications on your, uh, on your software. First of all, why is this necessary? Because it's polite. This is a conversation. You want conversations to be polite. If you terminate the conversation, right, if, uh, if side A sends, are you enjoying Geekon to, size, uh, to, um, to side B, and then just drops the connection, like falls off the face of the earth, right, restarts the computer, whatnot, and eventually side B answers, yep, it's a great conference, but side A no longer recognizes that the conversation is taking place, it's gonna send an, a, a reset or RST packet, which is essentially saying, who are you? Why are you talking to me right now? Like, we're not having a conversation, just go away, right? And that is incredibly impolite. And what, hap what you get on site B in this example is the very, very famous connection reset by peer error, right? Connection reset by peer means that one side of the conversation dropped the connection, just dropped the conversation, slammed down the phone without telling the other side, and then behaved as though the conversation never took place. And that is very impolite. And now it gets interesting, because suppose we have a conversation, and suppose we finish that conversation very, very cleanly. Remember, the network is asynchronous. Packets run around, they do things, they get duplicated and dropped and stuff. What happens when you have a connection, you're done with it, you establish a new connection, right, with the same parameters, the same, uh, the same host, the same port, et cetera, et cetera, and suppose this adios packet got delayed in traffic, got duplicated, and then came in, you know, 200 millisecond or two, two seconds or two days afterwards, right? If there is a new conversation going on, that packet might actually be considered to be part of the new conversation, and it could totally corrupt that conversation. This is potentially very, very dangerous. Now, this is not very probable. You need to have the same host and the same port number on both ends of the conversations. That's called a socket pair. 
And you need to have the same sequence number for that to make sense. If I'm expecting sequence number three, I get adios with sequence number nine, I'm just going to drop it. I'm going to ignore it. Or I'm going to reset the conversation. So this is not very probable. But that's the nice thing about the internet, because if you have any phenomenon that has a very low probability, you run it at internet scale for a long enough period of time, it will inevitably happen. So TCP has a lot of uh, built-in mechanisms to deal with that. The mechanism that you've probably come across, whether or not you understood it, is called time weight. Any closed socket, any clo the, the, site, the site that initiates the close, remains in a time-weight state after the connection closes. Uh, why? Exactly so that it has the state to say that this packet came in. It's an old external duplicate, right? The network caused this adios packet to come in when I'm having a, you know, a secondary conversation. So maybe it's best that I don't start another conversation on the same socket pair for a little bit of time. How long? Well, traditionally, two times the maximum segment length, uh, which in modern day internet is one minute. With this, we'll be wrapping up in 20 seconds. I just want to show you that we have google.com at this IP. We just issue a curl command, like an HTTP GET. And then when it's done, we now have a socket in time wait. Now, I'm not going to go into details about SO linger, despite my promise in the abstract, because we're out of time. Uh, but SO linger is oftentimes recommended as a way of avoiding time wait on the server. It is a terrible idea. Don't do it. And you have this nice face that tells you that you shouldn't. Uh, I apologize for running through the last few slides. We literally are out of time. I will, of course, be making this uh, slide deck available. There are some links here for further reading. You can spend a year reading about TCP, and you will not know everything there is to know. But this is a hugely interesting topic, and I highly recommend anyone with any shred of interest to just pick one of these up and start reading. With that, thank you very much, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. It's been great. Thank you.